Custom and Myth by Andrew Lang, Apollo and the Mouse. Why is Apollo, especially the Apollo of the Troad, he who showered the darts of pestilence among the Greeks so constantly associated with a mouse? The very name Smintheus, by which his favorite priest calls on him in the Iliad, might be rendered Mouse Apollo, or Apollo, Lord of Mice. As we shall see later, mice lived beneath the altar and were fed in the holy of holies of the God. And an instant and an, in, and an image of a mouse was placed beside or upon his sacred tripod. The ancients were puzzled by these things, and as will be shown, accounted for them by mouse stories so t- styled by Eustathius the medieval interpreter of Homer. Following our usual method, let us ask whether similar phenomena occur elsewhere in countries where they are intelligible. Did insignificant animals elsewhere receive worship? Were there effigies elsewhere placed in the temples of a pure creed? We find answers in the history of Peruvian religion. After the Spanish conquest of Peru, one of the European adventurers, Don Garcilaso de la Vega, married an Inca princess. Their son, also named Garcilaso, was born about 1540. His famous book, Commentaries Reales, contains the most authentic account of the old Peruvian beliefs. Garcilaso was learned in all the learning of the Europeans, and as an Inca of the mother's side, had claims on the loyalty of the defeated race. He set himself diligently to collect both their priestly and popular traditions and his account of them is the more trustworthy as it coincides with what we know to have been true in lands with which Garcilaso had little acquaintance. To Garcilaso's mind, Peruvian religion seems to be divided into two periods, the age before and the age which followed the accession of the Incas and their establishment of sun worship as the creed of the state. In the earlier period, the pre-Inca period, he tells us an Indian was not accounted honorable unless he was descended from a fountain, river, or lake, or even from the sea, or from a wild animal such as a bear, lion, tiger, eagle, or the bird they call or condor, or some other bird of prey. To these worshipful creatures, men offered that they usually saw them eat, but men were not content to adore large and dangerous animals. There was not an animal, how vile and filthy soever, that they did not worship as a god, including lizards, toads, and frogs. In the midst of these superstitions, the Incas appeared. Just as the tribes claimed descent from animals, great or small, so the Incas drew their pedigree from the sun, which they adored like the gens of the Aureoli in Rome. Thus, every Indian had his pacarissa, or as the North American Indians say, totem, a natural object from which he claimed descent and which, in a certain degree, he worshipped. Though sun worship became the established religion, worship of the animal Parcarissus was still tolerated. The sun temples also contained hookahs or images of the beasts which the Indians had venerated. In the great temple of Pacacamac, the most spiritual and abstract god of Peruvian faith, they worshipped a she-fox and an emerald. The devil also appeared to them, 
and spoke in the form of a tiger, very fierce. This toleration of an older and cruder in subordination to a pure faith is a very common feature in religious evolution. In Catholic countries to this day, we may watch in Holy Week the Adonis feast described by Theocritus and the procession and entombment of the old god of spring. The Incas had the good policy to collect all the tribal animal gods into their temples in and round Cusco, in which the two leading gods were the master of life and the sun. Did a process of this sort ever occur in Greek religion, and were older animal gods ever collected into the temples of such deities as Apollo? Well, a great deal of scattered evidence about many animals consecrated to Greek gods points in this direction. It will be enough for the present to examine the case of the sacred mice. Among races which are still in the totemistic stage, which still claim descent from animals, from other objects, a peculiar marriage law generally exists or can be shown to have existed. No man may marry a woman who is descended from the same ancestral animal and who bears the same totem name and carries the same badge or family crest as himself. A man descended from the crane and whose family name is Crane cannot marry a woman whose family name is Crane. He must marry a woman of the wolf or turtle or swan or other name and her children keep her family title, not his. Thus, if a crane man marries a swan woman, the children are swans, and none of them may marry a swan. They must marry turtles, wolves, or whatnot, and their children, again, are turtles or wolves. Thus, there is necessarily an eternal come and go of all the animal names known in a district. As civilization advances, these rules grow obsolete. People take their names from the father as among ourselves. Finally, the dwellers in a given district, having become united into a local tribe, are apt to drop the various animal titles and to adopt as the name of the whole tribe the name of the chief or of the predominating family. Let us imagine a district of some 20 miles in which there are crane, wolf, turtle, and swan families. Long residents together in common interests have welded them into a local tribe. The chief is of the wolf family, and the tribe sinking family differences in family names calls itself the wolves. Such tribes are probably in the beginning the inhabitants of the various Egyptian towns which severally worship the wolf, or the sheep, or the crocodile, and abstained religiously except on certain sacrificial occasions from the flesh of the animal that gave them its name. It's taken us long to reach the sacred mice of Greek religion, but we are now in a position to approach their august divinity. We've seen that the sun worshiping superseded without abolishing the tribal pacarissas in Peru and that the huacas or images of the sacred animals were admitted under the roof of the temple of the sun. Now it is recognized that the temples of the Smintian Apollo contain images of sacred mice among other animals. And our argument is that here, perhaps we have another example of the Peruvian religious evolution. Just as in Peru, the tribes adored vile and filthy animals, just as the solar worship of the Incas subordinated these, just as the hokas of the beasts remained in the temples of the Peruvian sun, so we believe the tribes along the Mediterranean coast had at some very remote prehistoric period their animal pecarissus. These were subordinated to the religion, to some extent, solar of Apollo, and the hokas or animal idols survived in Apollo's temple, temples. If this theory is correct, we shall probably find the mouse, for example, revered as a sacred animal in many places. 
This would necessarily follow if the marriage customs which we have described ever prevailed on Greek soil and scattered the mouse name far and wide. Traces of the mouse families and of adoration, if adoration there was of the mouse, would linger on in the following shapes. One, places would be named from mice, and mice would eventually, uh, and mice would actually be actually held sacred in themselves. Two, the mouse name would be given locally to the god who superseded the mouse. Three, the figure of the mouse would be associated with the god and used as a badge or a kind of crest or local mark in places where the mouse has been a venerated animal. Four, finally, myths would be told to account for the sacredness of a creature so undignified. Let us take these considerations in their order. One, if there were local mice tribes deriving their name from the worshipful mouse, certain towns settled by these tribes would retain a reverence for mice. In Chrysa, a town of the Troad, according to Heraclides Ponticus, mice were held sacred, the local name for mouse being something in Greek. Many places bore this mouse name, according to Strabo. This is precisely what would have occurred had the mouse totem and the mouse stock been widely distributed. Scolius mentions Smintus as a place in the Troad. Strabo speaks of two places deriving their name from Smintus or mouse near the Smintian temple and others near Larissa. In Rhodes and Lindus, the mouse place name recurs, and in many other districts, Strabo names Caressus and Poessa in Chaos, among the other places which had Smintian temples and presumably were once centers of tribes named after the mouse. Here then are a number of localities in which the mouse Apollo was adored, and where the old mouse name lingered. That the mice were actually held sacred in their proper persons, we learn from Ilion. The dwellers in Hamaxitis of the Troad worship mice, says Ilion, and the temple of Apollo Smintheus, mice are nourished and food is offered to them at the public expense, and white mice dwell beneath the altar. In the same way, we found that the Peruvians fed their sacred beasts on what they usually saw them eat. 2. The second point in our argument has already been sufficiently demonstrated. The mouse named Smintheus was given to Apollo in all the places mentioned by Strabo and many others. 3. The figure of the mouse will be associated with the god and used as a badge or crest or local mark in places where the mouse has been a venerated animal. The passage already quoted from Ilian informs us that there stood an effigy of the mouse beside the tripod of Apollo. In Chrysa, according to Strabo, the statue of Apollo Smintheus had a mouse beneath his foot. The mouse on the tripod of Apollo is represented as a base relief illustrating the plague and the offerings of the Greeks to Apollo Smintheus as described in the first book of the Iliad. The mouse is not an uncommon local badge or crest in Greece. The animals whose figures are stamped on coins like the Athenian owl are the most ancient marks of cities. It is a plausible conjecture that just as the Iroquois, when they signed treaties with the Europeans, used their totems, bear, wolf, and turtle as seals, so the animals on archaic Greek city coins represented crests or badges, which at some far more remote period had been totems. The Argives, according to Pollux, stamped the mouse on their coins. As there was a temple of Apollo Smintheus in Tenedos, we naturally hear of a mouse on the coins of the island. Golzio has published one of these mouse coins, the people of Metapontum, stamped their money with a mouse gnawing an ear of corn. The people of Kumai employed a mouse dormant. Halai 
fancy that certain mice on Roman medals might be connected to the family of Mus. But this is rather guesswork. We have now shown traces, at least, of various ways in which an early tribal religion of the mouse, the mouse pacarissa, as the Peruvians said, may have been perpetuated. When we consider that the superseding of the mouse by Apollo must have occurred, if it did occur, long before Homer, we may r rather wonder that the mouse left its mark on Greek religion so long we have seen mice revered a god with a mouse name, the mouse name recurring in many places. The huaca, or idol of the mouse, preserved in the temples of the god, and the mouse badge used in several widely severed localities. It remains for to examine the myths about mice. These, in our opinion, were probably told to account for the presence of the huaca of the mouse in temples and for the occurrence of the animal in religion and his connection with Apollo. A singular mouse myth narrated by Herodotus is worth examining for reasons which will appear later. Though the events are said to have happened on Egyptian soil, according to Herodotus, one Sethos, a priest of Hephaestus, Ta, was king of Egypt. He had disgraced the military class, and he found himself without an army when Sennacherib invaded his country. Sethos fell asleep in the temple, and the god appearing to him in a vision told him that divine Sukkar would come to the Egyptians. In the night before the battle, field mice gnawed the quivers and shield handles of the foe, who fled on finding themselves thus disarmed. And now, says Herodotus, there standeth a stone image of this king in the temple of Hephaestus and in the hand of the image a mouse and there is this inscription let whoso looketh on me be pious Professor Sace holds that there was no such person as Sethos but that the legend is evidently Egyptian not Greek and the name of the Sennacherib, as well as the fact of the Assyrian attack, is correct. The legend also, though Egyptian, is an echo of the biblical account of the destruction of the Assyrian army, an account which omits the mice. As to the mice here, says Professor Sayes, we have to do again with the Greek dragomen. The story of Sethos was attached to the statue of some deity which was supposed to hold a mouse in its hand. It must have been easy to verify this supposition, but Mr. Say says mice were not sacred in Egypt, nor were they used as symbols or found on the monuments. To this remark, we may suggest some exceptions. Apparently, this one mouse was found on the monuments. Wilkinson says mice do occur in the sculptures, but they were not sacred. Rats, however, were certainly sacred, and as little distinction is taken in myth between rats and mice as between rabbits and hares. The rat was sacred to Ra, the sun god, and like all totems, was not to be eaten. This association of the rat and the sun cannot but remind us of Apollo and his mouse. According to Strabo, a certain city of Egypt did worship the shrew mouse. The... Athribitae, or dwellers in Crocodilopolis, are the people to whom he attributes this cult, which he mentions among the other local animal worships of Egypt. Several porcelain examples of the field mouse sacred to Horus, commonly called Apollo by the Greeks, may be seen in the British Museum. The rats and field mice were sacred in Egypt. Then we may believe on the evidence of the ritual of Strabo and of many relics of Egyptian art. Herodotus, moreover, is credited when he says that the statue had a mouse on its hand. 
Elsewhere, it is certain that the story of mice gnawing the bowstrings occurs frequently as an explanation of mouse worship. One of the Trojan mouse stories ran that immigrants had set out in prehistoric times for Crete. The oracle advised them to settle wherever they were attacked by the children of the soil. At Hamaxidus in the Troad, they were assailed in the night by mice, which ate all that was edible of their armor and bowstrings. The colonists made up their mind that these mice were the children of the soil, settled here, and adored the mouse Apollo. A myth of this sort may either be a story invented to explain the mouse name or a mouse tribe like the red Indian wolves or crows may actually have been settled on the spot and may even have resisted invasion. Another myth of the Troad accounted for the worship of the mouse Apollo on the hypothesis that he had once freed the land from mice, like the Pied Piper of Hamelin, whose pipe, still serviceable, is said to have been found in his grave by men who were digging a mine. Stories like these, stories attributing some great deliverance to the mouse or some deliverance from mice to the god, would naturally spring up among people puzzled by their own worship of the mouse god or of the mouse. We have explained the religious character of mice as the relics of a past age in which the mouse had been a totem and mouse family names had been widely diffused. That there are and have been mice totems and mouse family names among Semitic stocks around the Mediterranean is proved by Professor Robertson Smith. Akbor the mouse is an Edomite name, apparently a stock name as the Jerboa and another mouse name were among the Arabs. The same name occurs in Judah where totemism ex- where totemism exists, the members of each stock either do not eat the ancestral animal at all or only eat him on rare sacrificial occasions. The totem of a hostile stock may be eaten by way of insult. In the case of the mouse, Isaiah seems to refer to one or other of these practices. They that together, saith the Lord... Oh, sorry. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. This is like the Egyptian prohibition to eat the abominable, that is, tabooed or forget, forbidden, rat of Ra. If the unclean animals of Israel were originally the totems of each clan, then the mouse was a totem. For the chosen people were forbidden to eat the weasel and the mouse and the tortoise after his kind. That unclean beasts, beasts not to be eaten, were originally totems. Professor Robertson Smith infers from Ezekiel where we find 70 of the elders of Israel, that is, the heads of houses, worshipping in a chamber which had on its walls the figures of all manner of unclean, tabooed, creeping things and quadrupeds, even all the idols of the house of Israel. Some have too hastily concluded that the mouse was a sacred animal among the neighboring Philistines. After the Philistines had captured the ark and set it in the house of Dagon, the people were smitten with disease. They therefore, in accordance with a well-known savage magical practice, made five golden representations of the diseased part and five golden mice as a trespass offering to the Lord of Israel and so restored the ark. Such votive offerings are common still in Catholic countries, and the mice of gold by no means proved that the Philistines had ever worshipped mice. Turning to India from the Mediterranean basin and the Aryan, Semitic, and Egyptian tribes on its coast, we find the mouse was the sacred animal of Rudra, the mouse rudra is thy beast, says their Yajur Veda, as rendered by Groman in his Apollo Smintheus. Groman recognizes in rudra a deity with most of the characteristics of Apollo. 
In later Indian mythology, the mouse is an attribute of Ganaka, who, like Apollo Smintheus, is represented in art with his foot upon a mouse. Such are the chief appearances of the mouse in ancient religion. If he really was a Semitic totem, it may perhaps be argued that his prevalence in connection with Apollo is the result of a Semitic leaven in Hellenism. Hellenic invaders may have found Semitic mouse tribes at home and incorporated the alien stock deity with their own Apollo worship. In that case, the mouse, while still originally a totem, would not be an Aryan totem, but probably the myths and rites of the mouse and their diffusion are more plausibly explained on our theory that on that of De Gubernatus, the pagan sun god crushes under his foot the mouse of night. When the cat's away, the mice may play. The shadows of night dance when the moon is absent. This is one of the quaintest pieces of mythological logic. Obviously, when the cat, the moon, is away, the mice, the shadows, cannot play. There is no light to produce a shadow. As usually chances, the scholars who try to resolve all the features of myth into physical phenomena do not agree among themselves about the mouse. When the mouse is the night, according to M. D. Gubernatus, in Groman's opinion, the mouse is the lightning. He argues that the lightning was originally regarded by the Aryan race as the flashing tooth of a beast, especially of a mouse. Afterwards, men came to identify the beast with his teeth, and behold, the lightning and the mouse are convertible mythical terms. Now, it is perfectly true that savages regard many elemental phenomena from eclipses to the rainbow as a result of the action of animals. The rainbow is a serpent. Thunder is caused by the thunderbird, who has actually been shot in Dakota, and who is familiar to the Zulus, while rain is the milk of a heavenly cow an idea recurring in the Zind Avesta. But it does not follow because savages believe in these meteorological beasts that all the beasts in myth were originally meteorological. Man raised a serpent to the skies, perhaps, but his interest in the animal began on earth, not in the clouds. It is excessively improbable and quite unproved that any race ever regarded lightning as the flashes of a mouse's teeth. The hypothesis is a judea spirit, like the, apo- the opposite hypothesis about the mouse of night. In these and all the other current theories of the Smithian Apollo, the widely diffused worship of ordinary mice and such small deer has been either wholly neglected or explained by the first theory of symbolism that occurred to the conjecture of a civilized observer. The facts of savage animal worship and their relations to totemism seems still unknown to or unappreciated by scholars, with the exception of Mr. Sace, who recognizes totemism as the origin of the zoomorphic element in Egyptian religion. Our explanation, whether adequate or not, is not founded on an isolated case. If Apollo superseded and absorbed the worship of the mouse, he did no less for the wolf, the ram, the dolphin, and several other animals whose images were associated with his own. The Greek religion was more refined and anthropomorphic than that of Egypt. In Egypt, the animals were still adored, and the images of the gods had bestial heads. In Greece, only a few gods, and chiefly in very archaic statues, had bestial heads. But beside the other deities, the sculptors set the owl, eagle, wolf, serpent, tortoise, mouse, or whatever creature was the local favorite of the deity. Probably the deity had, in the majority of cases, superseded the animal and succeeded to his honors but the conservative religious sentiment retained the beast within the courts and in the suit and service of the anthropomorphic god. The process by which the god ousted the beast may perhaps be observed in Samoa. There, as Dr. Turner tells us in his Samoa, each family has its own sacred animal, which it may not eat. If this law be transgressed, the the malefactor is supernaturally punished in a variety of ways, but while each family has thus its its totem, Four or five different families recognize an owl, crab, lizard, and so on, incarnations of the same god, say of Tongo. If Tongo had a temple among these families, we can readily believe that images of the various beasts in which he was incarnate would be kept within the consecrated walls. Savage ideas like these, if they were ever entertained in Greece, would account for the holy animals of the different deities. 
but it is obvious that the phenomena which we have been studying may be otherwise explained. It may be said that the Smithian Apollo was only revered as the enemy and opponent of mice. St. Gertrude, whose heart was eaten by mice, has the same role in France. The worship of Apollo and the badge of the mouse would on this principle be diffused by colonies from some center of the faith. The images of mice in Apollo's temples would be nothing more than votive offerings. Thus, in the church of a Saxon town, the verger shows a silver mouse dedicated to Our Lady. This is the greatest of our treasures, says the verger. Our town was overrun with mice till the ladies of the city offered the mouse of silver. Instantly, all the mice disappeared. And are you such fools as to believe that the creatures went away because a silver mouse was dedicated? Asked the Prussian officer. No, replied the verger rather neatly, or long ago we should have offered a silver Prussian.